On Earth, there are 193 countries. One of the countries is called Australia. Australia has six states and two territories. One of the states is called New South Wales. New South Wales has a city called Bathurst. Bathurst has a mountain called Mount Panorama, and ever since 1963, this has happened there. It's 1938, and this guy wants a racetrack in his hometown. Knowing the full well, it won't be approved. So he tricked the high-ranked politicians into funding a scenic route to attract tourists. Just weeks after its completion, it held its first ever race, the Australian Tourist Trophy. Fast forward to 1963, and the Australian Production Car Championship are looking for a track capable enough to hold their annual 500 mile race. One of the boys is like, There is a track in Bathurst that goes hard. We should get it up. And all the lads were like, Oh, very good then, for the match. Yes, indeed. And just like that, the iconic Bathurst race came to fruition. The race cars that competed in the production car championship were just that. Production cars bought straight from the showroom floor, divided into different classes depending on their price, and raced. The Ford Cortina GTs and Mini Cooper S's were the big hitters of the early events. By 1967, Ford Australia made a phone call to their big brother over at Ford America and were all like, Know those really popular Mustangs you have over there that are powered by the 289 Windsors? Is there any chance that we can import a couple of those V8s to put in one of our locally built Falcons so we can win Bathurst with it? And the Yanks being the top blokes of the yard, we're all like, Hell yeah, brother. And the Ford XR GT Falcon was born and went on to be the first V8 powered car to win the race. The Australian Master Car era was born. Holden, which is Australia's division of General Motors, saw what Ford were doing with the American V8s and their locally built Fords and did the same strategy the following years with MNRO, stopping them with small block Chevy V8s from America. Ford, upset with losing at their own game, put out all the stops with the latest model of Ford, giving their driver, Alan Moffat, back-to-back -back victories in 1970 and 71. Knock, knock. Who's there? Peter Brock. He's all like, how about we use more fuel efficient six cylinder engines in a smaller car, the Tirana, and use it to do less pit stops throughout the event and win the race that way? He'd used his technique to win in 1972, but the strategy was short-lived because this would be the last time a non-V8 powered car would win until the Group 8 era over 10 years later. Then the great supercar scare of 72 happened. Pretty much the Karens of the day were upset that people were having fun with high-powered cars at Bathurst. And they tried to put a stop to it. Ford and Holden were somewhat forced to cut their backing of teams, but they still enjoyed the event. The rest of the decade was made up of Holden and Ford training blows in their V8 monsters. Ford would win with their Falcon one year, and the next year Holden would hit back with their Tirana, now stuffed with a powerful V8 engine too. The most notable achievements at his time were the change in format from 500 miles to 1,000 kilometers in 1973. Regulation changes that allowed wider racing tires to be fitted to cars as well as more safety equipment. Group C is born. The first ever 1-2 form finish in 1977 by Moffat and Brock's dominant victory in 1979, winning by over 6 laps to the 2nd place car. By 1980, Brock is on an absolute tear and looking to easily win 3 years in a row, until privateer Dick Johnson showed up on the scene. Johnson, who mortgaged his house and blew his life savings to build a bad fast XD Falcon with no serious support, would smoke everyone to the weeds in the opening laps of the event. That wasn't until by some way or somehow a rock made its way onto the track, which Johnson hit, wiping him completely out of the race and destroying his car. The devastated Johnson was guided back to the pits, his dream and personal finances in a state of disrepair. Viewers at home, also upset with the turn of events, started donating money to the broke Johnson to help rebuild his car that was completely destroyed. Brock went on to win the race, making him the first person to win the event three years in a row. In 81, Johnson using the donated funds from the Australian people and Ford Australia would rebuild his car and win the event, which made for a pretty cool comeback story. Someone should make an in-depth video about this. In 1982, Brock would remember how awesome it was to win three Bathurst in a row, so he would do it again. Then, in 1985, something that hasn't happened to Australia since 1770 occurred. The British discovered the land and claimed it as their own. But this time, instead of using sailing ships like Captain Cook did, they used the European-style race cars and the rule books that they came under that made all the locally built cars that were much faster illegal due to their engine sizes and tire width. Group A is born. <laughs> to say that this new rule package was unpopular is quite the understatement and it was very easy to see why. 
Out were the local heroes of big tired Commodores and large engine Falcons, and in came the Jaguars, neutered small tire Commodores, Nissan Skylines, Ford Mustangs, and later on Ford Sierras. The European spec cars were much slower too. The pole time in 1985 was five seconds slower than the pole time of the previous year's race. In fact, all but one of the cars in the previous year's top 10 was quicker than the 1985 time. Oh, that makes sense. But on the plus side, there were four different makes of cars from three different countries to find the top step of the podium in eight years. Despite the drop in pace, the risk was as high as ever and was made tragically evident during the 1986 running of the event when coming down Commodore Strait, Mike Bergerman lost control of his Commodore and hit the retaining wall with fatal results. The following year, the Chase Chicane was added to the long straight in an attempt to slow the cars down. The start of this new era with the Chase Chicane being added to the circuit would mark the end of an old era as this would be the year that Peter Brock would get his ninth and final Bathurst 1000 victory. The 1992 running of the event would see the last year of the race be run under Group A rule and would be taken out by the Almighty Nissan R32 GTR Skyline Godzilla even after crashing. No. Oh no. The red caused the red flag and the Nissan was determined the winner. The crowd weren't the happiest about his victory, but race winner, gentleman Jim Richards, took it well. Come on, you're a pack of assholes. In 1993, the unpopular Group A rules were replaced with the much loved and still in effect Australian touring car rules that featured high output V8 powered saloon cars from Ford and Holden, a recipe that was so popular during the 1970s and early 80s. V8 supercars are born. It changed its name over the years, but the formula is most of the same to this day. And just like back in the 70s, it was a tip for tap battle between Holden and Ford once again. Hold would win, then Ford would punch back next year, then Hold would hit back again, sometimes coming from last place to do so. Guy in last position has won the race. Never been done. And then in 1997, it was won by a BMW. Wait, what? Okay guys, stick with me here. In 1997 and 1998, two Bathurst 1000s came to be because of a telecast dispute. The newly made their supercars telecast rights came under Channel 10, which had absolutely nothing to do with the Bathurst 1000 event itself, because Bathurst Supercars ran their own event and was their own separate entity. But the Bathurst 1000 telecast rights came under Channel 7. Channel 7 now upset with the fact that Channel 10 held the Bathurst 1000 for Bathurst Supercars, which they had no jurisdiction over, now made their own Bathurst 1000 telecast featuring two litre super tourists from Europe in the hope of cutting themselves a nice slice of the Bathurst 1000 cake yet again. One of these two formulas would be very, very popular, and the other one, not so much, and would die out by 1999. Back in V8 land for good now, it was a great mix of Holden and Ford victories, until it wasn't. At the turn of the millennium, it came an absolute bloodbath, and it was almost impossible for Holden to lose. They would win back to back to back to back to back to back to back victories. The Fords had plenty of lightning fast Falcons, but the racing gods were just never on their side. No, this is race leader Paul Radisic. Front right has blown. That is one of the most gut-wrenching moments I think I've ever seen. A mountain panorama, 20 laps to go. This team has looked so strong, has led so many laps. Oh, but Ford's heartache at Bathurst would seem minimal in comparison to what would happen on September 8th, 2006. Tonight, Australia loses another hero. Bathurst legend Peter Brock killed in a rally crash north of Perth. There was not a single Australian that wasn't affected by the loss of his national treasure in some way. He vibed in the same frequency of acclaim as Bruce McLaren, Dale Earnhardt, Ann Santa, and Jim Clark did for their homelands. Then a month later came arguably the most important race in Bathurst history, the 2006 running of the event. The feelings around the race were very sombre, with pre-race remembrances consisting of a parade of all the cars Brock had used to win the race in front of a record sellout crowd. And one of these cars was driven by Craig Lowndes. It was no secret that when Brock was nearing retirement, he wanted to teach some of his skills to the next generation, and Craig Lowndes was all too happy to pick up his offerings. They had an unbreakable family-like relationship, and Brock's death was a terrible loss for Craig Lowndes, and nothing meant more to Lowndes than avenging his great friend and mentor by winning the trophy now named in Brock's honour. But it has been 10 years since his Hayes only win at the event, and he was now in a Ford. All that people remembered him for at this point was being the biggest trader in racing history. None of this mattered to him though, as he lined up 6 on the grid with one guy in mind. What followed was a thousand kilometres of pure auto racing poetry. He's got a problem in his pitting, I should say. Oh, and he's overshot the marker here. Can you hear us running on eight at the moment? Oh, no more trouble at the top of the hill. This time it's car number 17. And this weekend has been all about farewelling the great man, Peter Brock. 
the friend and mentor to Craig Lowndes. This will be a huge outpouring of emotion. Ten years in the waiting. Lowndes and Wincup do it. Lowndes and his teammate Jamie Wincup would go on to win three years in a row, just like Brocky did in the 80s and late 70s. In 2010, a rule change would happen that would force all the main drivers to power over a driver from outside the main series of competition. This wouldn't change the results for Lowndes, who would go on to win regardless of his teammate, but this would be the era where Top Gun driver Jamie Wincup would become a meme. Hello darkness, my old friend. While this was going on, the greatest motor race ever would happen in 2014. I'm not even going to cover it, just do yourself a favour and watch Josh Ravel's video on it. Lance would go on to get two more victories in 2015 and 2018. In 2016, Will Davidson would drive through the late race mayhem to go from fourth to victory to get his second Bathurst win since 2009. The following year, David Reynolds would get a very popular victory in a mostly wet race. 2019 would see current IndyCar star and Kiwi Scotty McLaughlin put his name on the very impressive winners list in his Ford Mustang. This was the first time a two-door car had won since the Group A era mentioned earlier. 2020 would belong to fellow Kiwi Shane Van Gisbergen and would be his first ever win at the event. 2021's victory belonged to Chad Mostert and this would be the first time since 2003 that the person staying on pole would actually go on to win the race. 2022 saw Shane Van Gisbergen's second event win and the last for Holden as a brand, as the name brand was dropped by GM's lineup, making for a bittersweet moment. And that pretty much brings us to now. It's been a long journey, and I know that I didn't cover everything. Just one of these stories alone could have easily been a half-hour video. Massive shout to Bill Watts and Roman Hill. Impersonation truly is the greatest form of flattery. And a massive shout out to all you guys that watched this video. I really hope you enjoyed watching it as much as I enjoyed making it for you. So, uh... Thanks for all that and uh, peace out.